Is it well with your soul? I'm so glad I got a football today. I'm going to preach with my football. I'm not going to leave it. I don't trust my wife that much. Bring my football with me. Hey, is it well with your soul? I mean, do we understand what it means? It is well with our soul. I remember fourth grade. I, it was well with my soul, right? Going out on the, the black top and throwing the football around and, and having a good time with your buddies at recess. There was nothing better in fourth grade than recess time. The best part of school. It is well with my soul. I, 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 I love going to, to birthday parties and events where we get to celebrate things. I, um, I was thinking about Chantel and Aiden's wedding. I think that was the last wedding uh, that I was at. But man, it's fun when we get together and we celebrate, isn't it? Right? I don't dance, but I like to watch you goofy people get out there and try to dance and, and do all of that stuff and be together as a family and laugh. And um, I like to get together with family members and reminisce and share stories and be goofy together. And, and in those moments, isn't it well with our soul? Like that's what we were created to do, to worship our God, but also to be in relationship with one another. And in those good moments of life, it is so easy to kind of look around and say, man, it is good. It is well with my soul. That's what I think about when we gather together every Sunday and we, we begin to sing together and pray together and read scripture together. Man, it is well with my soul. But do you know that that song was not written at the greatest of time? I was, I was uh, looking at this story this week. I, I, I didn't know much about this individual who wrote this song, Horatio Spafford. What a great name, right? Horatio Spafford. I didn't know much about his story. And so I was doing some reading and some investigating this week. And I was so overwhelmed by the story. I, I went over to Pastor Isaac and I was like, do you know this story? And he was like, yeah, everybody knows this story. And I was like, wait, what? I didn't know this story. Pastor Isaac just assumed you guys all knew it, but I'm gonna let you know. So Horatio Spafford, the, the man who wrote this song, um, in, in, in 1870, so 150 years ago, um, uh, this man and his wife, they lived in, sh in Chicago, the Chicago area, and he was a lawyer there. And in 1870, him and his wife, they had a four-year-old son, and they lost their son to pneumonia in 1870. Man, I, I cannot imagine losing a kid. Cannot imagine losing a kid. In 1871, you may know 1871 if, if you remember back in school, but there was a lot of fires in 1871. There's a lot of fires in the Chicago area. And in 1871, Horatio and his family, they lost a lot of their home, their house, and their real estate in the Chicago fires. 1870, he loses his son. 1871, he, he loses pretty much all of his possessions to the fires in Chicago. In 1873, uh, Horatio and his wife and his four daughters, they decided that they were going to go on vacation and, and to get away from life for a little bit. And so um, uh, they were decided they were going to go to Europe. They were going to go to France. And so he puts his wife and his four kids on this boat to go over to France. He had some obligations. He had some things that were going on at work that he kind of had to stay around for, and he was going to catch up with them a little bit later. And so he puts his wife and his four daughters on a boat, and he would see them in a week or so. Well, as they were kind of going over to, to, uh, to Europe, their, their ship, another ship ran into their ship. And within 12 minutes, the, the ship uh, that Horatio's wife was on and his four daughters, in 12 minutes, it sank. His wife survived uh, the, the accident, but he lost his four daughters in that accident. And it's crazy, like as, as news came to Horatio, obviously he jumped on another boat. They didn't have airplanes then. And so he has to jump on another boat and he's going over to console his wife. Think about the three-year window that they have just experienced. He, he lost the son, they've lost uh, the majority of their possessions and now he has lost his four daughters. And he's on this boat and he's heading over there and he writes the words that it is well with my soul. That makes no sense to me, right? I mean, but you, you read the words, uh, the, the song, and, and you see words like sorrow. You see the words like trials. You, you see the word of, of helpless. You see the word of sin. And then it gets to the chorus, but it is well with my soul. 
That doesn't make any sense. Doesn't make any sense. You know, there's several characters in the Bible, and this is why I encourage you to be in your Bible a lot, that it was not well with their souls. There were some people that were crying out. There were some emotions. There were some things. Uh, they, they were living in some chaotic times in the Bible. And I think it's important that as we talk about it is well, and we discover what does it mean it is well with my soul, that we look at a few of these stories together. And so if you have your Bible, I know you're going to find the book of Habakkuk. Many of you know the book of Habakkuk. There's a reason there's a table of contents in the front of your Bible. All right, we're going to be in the book of Habakkuk. Uh, we're going to look uh, specifically at chapter 3, and then we're also going to be in Psalm 13. And I want to read a little bit of this for you as we discover what does it mean that it is well with our soul. Habakkuk. Habakkuk is an interesting character in the Bible. Not only does he have a fantastic name, but he was a prophet in the southern kingdom. Now, let me remind you just a little bit of Israel's history. Remember, Israel kind of had this like on again, off again relationship with God. You know, sometimes they were faithful. Sometimes they, they did the things that God asked them to do. And then sometimes they were disobedient. And, and so what happened is King David was, you know, a good king and, and he was obedient and trying to follow uh, the law and the, and the things that God had designed for them. And then Solomon wasn't as great of a king. And because of the disobedience of the people that Solomon's uh, family line, it, uh, it wasn't going to continue. And the kingdom was actually divided into the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom because of their disobedience. And we find ourselves around, you know, 720, 722, you guys know this, right? That the northern kingdom was attacked and they were completely destroyed by this group of people called the Assyrians. And they were the big bully of the day. And because of the people's disobedience, God allowed their enemies to literally wipe them out. But there was still the southern kingdom, and, and that's, that's where Habakkuk was. And, and he was around, around the 600s, and, and he was the prophet. He was supposed to be the mouthpiece of God to the people. Well, they decided that they were going to do things their own way as well. Even though they had seen the chaos before them, they had seen the, the destruction of the northern kingdom, they for some reason got in their mind that they could figure it out, and so they decided to do things their own way. And so we have the Assyrians who are the powerhouse of the day. And then there's this another group that kind of comes on the scene called the Babylonians. And the Babylonians come in and they take out the Assyrians. And after they take out the Assyrians, the next logical step was that they would come down and they would take out the southern kingdom, the nation of Judah, right? And so Habakkuk is this prophet and he's seeing all of this play out. He's heard the stories about the northern kingdom. He is seeing that the Babylonians have now taken out the Assyrians he sees that the next step is that they're going to come down and they're going to wipe out him and his family and the people he cares about. And here's the words that Habakkuk uh, says in Habakkuk chapter 1, verses 2 through 4. It says this. He says this, How long, O Lord, must I call for help? But you don't listen. Violence is everywhere, I cry, but you don't come to save us. Must I forever see these evil deeds? Why must I watch all of the misery? Wherever I look, I see destruction and violence. I am surrounded by people who love to argue and to fight. The law has been paralyzed. There is no justice in the courts. The wicked far outnumber the righteous so that justice has become perverted. These are not great days for Habakkuk, for his family, for his friends the destruction that he can see coming. And so with a very emotional heart, he is crying out to God. We also see this in our friend David. David says this in Psalm 13, O Lord, how long will you forget me? Forever? How long will you look the other way? How long must I struggle with anguish in my soul, with sorrow in my heart every day? How long will my enemies have the upper hand? Turn and answer me, O Lord, my God. Restore the sparkle to my eyes or I will die. Don't let my enemies gloat saying we have defeated him. Don't let them rejoice at my downfall. Do you hear the emotion in both of these individuals' lives? And, and we could look at several characters in the Bible and we can look at their stories and we can see them crying out to God in the midst of the chaos that they were experiencing. Have you ever been there? It's crazy. Sometimes we like, we want to keep that emotion in. We want to keep those hard questions. 
We don't want to challenge God. We don't want to challenge his ways. And so we try to keep that close to our chest. But, but we see these prominent people crying out to God and not asking easy questions, asking really, really hard questions. This is Habakkuk. This is the guy that, that, that's supposed to have it all together. That's supposed to be the mouthpiece of God speaking on behalf of the people. And now we see him here almost challenging God in this moment. The same thing we see with David. David's like, where are you? Have you ever been there? God, where are you? In the midst of the situation, are, are you even listening? You pray and you pray and you pray and you're seeking God and you're like, God, where are you? Do you see me? Do you see me in my chaos? Do you see me in my misery? Are you listening? Why are you so silent? What, you ever ask this question, what did I do to offend you? God, have I brought this on myself? I, I found myself in this place many times in life, many more than I want to. I remember the night of my dad's accident. God, where are you? I thought you loved me. I thought you loved my family. I thought you were blessing us. I thought you were gonna care for us. I remember saying those words that night. I remember when my mom got her diagnosis of cancer. And I remember sitting in that room with my mom. Where are you? I thought you said you loved me. I thought you said you were gonna care for me. I thought you were gonna provide for me. Not only the, the things that I need, but you were gonna provide health for my family. I remember the miscarriages. I remember those hard moments where I sat there next to my wife as she was going through some of the hardest moments of her life. God, where are you? Are you even listening? Do you see the chaos that is going on in my life? We're crying out to you. Why are you not responding? I, I look at my family members and friends who are, who are struggling around me and going through horrible moments of their life. And I'm like, God, where are you? They're crying out to you. They, they need your help. They need respite from whatever they're experiencing. God, why are you not seeing your people and responding to your people in those moments. God, where are you? Many of you, have, have, it's such a privilege to be a pastor and you guys don't always get to see things kind of from my point of view. And, but many of you come to me and just say, hey, pastor, will you pray with me on this? Hey, pastor, this is kind of going on in my life. And, and I just want to tell you, like that is such a privilege for me to know some of the struggles that are going on in your life. But, but when you do that, I now carry that with you. And I, I, I plead on behalf of God of like, I'm seeing my friends, my family, the people that, that I love and I, I'm on mission with and part of our church. And I, I see some of the broken areas of your family and your marriages and the brokenness between your kids and your grandkids and the financial hardships and, and the struggles that are going on around you. And I'm like, God, where are you? You been there? You know what I'm talking about? Have you had these hard conversations with God? Do you get answers? Does he respond to you? Does it feel like there's moments in your life where God is just silent? I often think about those that, that were in Egypt in slavery for 400 years. And I'm like, they, how many prayers would have been lifted up in that 400 year span where God finally in Exodus chapter three, I hear the cry of my people. Well, duh, your people have been crying out for literally hundreds of years, God. Where you been? What are you doing? Do you not love us? Do you not care about us? And where else can we turn? Where else could the people of Israel turn when they were in slavery? Where else can we turn when we find ourselves in hospital rooms and in and, and courtrooms and all these places where life becomes overwhelming? Where else can we turn? I mean, God is the one who knitted us together. We read about it in Psalm 139. God is the one who knows us. Nobody knows us better than our God. Our God spoke creation into existence. If anybody can make a difference, if anybody could change the scenario, wouldn't it be God? God is the one that is presence everywhere. We believe that God is present from the very beginning to the very, very end. In every moment, God is present. Well, that's great. Is God just standing in the corner? not responding when I'm in the darkest moments of my life. When, when I need God the most, it feels like that God is the most silent. 
God, where are you? Are you hearing me? Are you listening to me? I'm hurting. I need you. I mean, can you imagine Habakkuk as he is just literally watching and waiting for them to be destroyed? Can't imagine it. Of what that would mean for him and the people he loves and his family and those that he cares for, watching destruction come their way. Not the end of the story. Not the end of the story. Do you guys know the, the one Seagate Center, the one Seagate downtown, the third building? Richard, you know that building, right? Second biggest building in Toledo, from what I know, from what Wikipedia tells us today. The one thing I, I love about, uh, I've been in this, in this building several times um, uh, to the more of the top floor. What always amazes me is the view, the view that you can see of the city. And you can go to, to, to the different corners of that building and you can see the different uh, places around our city, the different landmarks. And, and I, I would be a really, really bad employee if I worked for Eastman and Smith because I, I would get very, very distracted by the views of this place. One time I was up there, I had a meeting up there. We did a staff retreat thing up there in, in one of the boardrooms. And, and I remember as we were in the room, um, there was an emergency going on somewhere in the city. I, I don't even remember where it was. But you could see all of these, the, the fire trucks and the ambulance and, and the response team. And they were coming from different places in the city. And if you could like see the cars and you could kind of see where they were going, you could follow it and you could see the smoke that was there. And I remember that it was so unique that um, it was so coordinated how they were responding to the situation. But I had never seen it from that view. I had never seen it from that point of view before. Typically, the point of view that, that we see is, is the street level view, right? We, we see the, the fire truck going by us. We see the ambulance going by us. We see those first responders, you know, going to the situation, and we have no idea where they're going or how many people are going and how they're going to respond to that situation, but we know and we trust that they're going to meet the need when they get to that place. And what this reminds me of is, I think this is how God sees things. You know, we talk about this from time to time, that, that his understanding, his ways are above our ways. But we actually believe that. <laughs> and we don't always get to see God's point of view. It never sometimes makes sense to us. You know, God is outside of time. God has always been here. God will always be here. God is in this moment, but he's also in 1870. He is also in the future. God is outside of time. And so God is seeing things happen. And we believe, we put our trust is that God is working out all of these things for him and his kingdom and his will to be done. And sometimes when we only get the street view, sometimes when we only get the view from our perspective, things don't make sense. And things may never make sense, right? I'll, I'll never understand why my dad was taken. I use the word taken. I'm not sure that's the best. While my dad passed away that night. I'm not sure why my mom was diagnosed with cancer and gone at such a young age. I'm not sure why certain things have happened to me in my life because I only see it from my view, my experience. But if we go back to the song, It Is Well With My Soul, the only thing that we can do is trust that from God's perspective is that God is making all things right. Even if I don't see it, even if I'm not experiencing it, we trust that God is working and God is meeting us there, even when we don't see him. Look at the words, it says this in Habakkuk 3. If you turn over just a page, Habakkuk 3, verse 16 says this. He says, I trembled inside when I heard this. My lips quivered with fear. My legs gave away beneath me and I shook in terror. He was recounting how God had been faithful to them in the past. I will wait quietly for the coming day. 
when disaster will strike the people who invade us. And even though the fig trees have no blossoms and there are no grapes on the vines, and even though the olive crop fails and the fields lie empty and barren, and even though the flocks die in the fields and the cattle barns are empty, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in the God of my salvation. The sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes me as sure-footed as a deer, also to tread upon the heights. Habakkuk's story doesn't end well. As far as we know, that he was with his people when they were destroyed. It wasn't a good outcome. Not all stories end well. We, we, we could look at Psalm 13, right? We can go back there and, and to see how that one uh, ends because we know the end of David's story. But in Psalm 13, he says, I will trust in your unfailing love. I will rejoice because you have rescued me. I will sing to the Lord because he is good. Sometimes it ends well. Sometimes we see God heal. Sometimes we see God restore. Sometimes we see God bring peace to the chaos of our lives. And for those people around us, sometimes we don't see it. Sometimes we're like Habakkuk. Destruction's gonna come. But the, but the question is, what are we gonna do when it ends in destruction? What are we going to do when there's no grapes on the vines? There's no olive crop. The fields are empty. This is their lifeline. There's no cattle in the barns. Are we able to say, I will rejoice in the Lord? I will be joyful in the God of my salvation. I hope so. Not easy, church. I mean, we're talking about real life. Like we believe that these are real stories. These are real people. And they've gone ahead, us, ahead of us and, and we get to look at their stories. And, and again, we get to see kind of the, the end of their story and we get to see the bigger picture of how God's working. But sometimes like when we're caught in the middle of it, when we're caught in the street view of our lives, we don't get to see the end of our story. But both men, both individuals in this story ended with, but I'll rejoice in the Lord. I will trust him. Why? Because what else do we have? What else do we have? If we have to turn to the creator of the earth, if, if we need a miracle, the only one that can do it is God. Right? The, the God who knows and sees what I need tomorrow, that is the God that we continue to go before. Why? Because nobody else can see tomorrow like our God can. Nobody has the resources to meet the need. And yes, even when God is standing in the corner and we feel like he is not hearing us, that he is not listening to us, we have to trust that somehow from his view, from his vantage point, that he is caring for us, even when we don't see him working. So my two thoughts is, is, is God was preparing this in me this week. One is, are you willing to share your questions and your emotions with God. Again, God already knows them. God knows what you're feeling. God knows what you're experiencing right now in this moment. But still God asks us to pray, to reach out to him, to be honest with him, to share our emotions, to ask the hard questions. Are you willing to do that? And then the second thing is, whether we know the outcome or not, are you willing to say, I trust God. It is well with my soul. Because in the end, God wins. God wins. In the end, God makes all things right. I wish I could say that every one of your stories is going to end like David. That you're going to see the fruits of your effort and and those around you are going to be cared for for generations. But even if my family ends like the story of Habakkuk, I still want to say, I trust my God. I don't understand it. I don't always see it. I don't always get it. But I trust God in all areas of my life. And so this morning, we can't just close. We can't just leave here and, and not deal with 
some of the stuff we just talked about. I know too many of you. <laughs> I know too many of what's going on in your life. And even though maybe you're the only one in this room that even knows what's going on in your world, God knows and God wants to hear from you. And so we're going we're gonna to sing a song and I'm going to invite them to come back up. And, but I wondered if, if this morning if, if you would feel comfortable to use the altars. And someone could pray with you or, or maybe you just want to come up here on your own. But I, I just wonder this morning if you'll be open and honest to cry out to your God. Nobody else can save you. Nobody else can give you the answers. Nobody else can be with you when you need him the most. Will you be willing to seek God this morning? And then when you leave everything at the feet of our God, will you be willing to stand up and turn around and say, guess what? It is well with my soul.